Hey everyone, Justin Jolien here. Great to see you. I'm excited to share with you this running specialist report on new Achilles tendinopathy strength progression guidelines. Now there's a lot of information out there on Achilles tendinopathy. We know it's very, very common among runners. We also know it can be very hard to rehabilitate. So what we know thus far is that plantar flexor strengthening is the gold standard treatment approach. However, until recently, it really wasn't understood which exercises to do, how often to do them, and what the progression was. So where we start with learning this information is actually to go back and learn the subtypes of Achilles tendinopathy. And those are broken into, as you can see here, insertional Achilles tendinopathy and mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy. And let me give you a little bit more information on how to differentiate where they are. Now, as the name might clue you into, insertional is going to be those tendinopathies that the pain points and the symptoms are going to be within two centimeters of the Achilles tendon insertion. Where the mid-portion Achilles tendinopathy are going to be two to seven centimeters proximal to the Achilles tendon insertion. Now, insertional is approximately 66% of cases, and the mid-portion is going to be more like 34% of cases. Now, the reason why we want to know these two different types is because it's important when we actually prescribe an exercise progression. So, what are the ways to prescribe an exercise progression that is evidence-based? Well, Achilles tendinopathy is going to respond best to eccentric strengthening. That's a very, very important. Eccentric strengthening with heavy resistance. We see that that's actually one of the best things that people can do in terms of getting back from Achilles tendinopathy. We also see that plyometrics is an important part of a rehabilitation program. However, it's really the eccentric strengthening with heavy resistance, especially for runners. Now, to accurately prescribe appropriate exercise load, there are several decisions that you should make and use guidelines to make those decisions. So let's break up those decisions and those guidelines here so we can better understand how we provide evidence-based exercises. So one of the guidelines is going to be that you'd want to use the visa A to measure disability, and you want to be able to use the pneumatic rating scale to be able to monitor symptoms. So basically what we want to do is we want to give them a questionnaire, that's the visa A, and then we also want to make sure we're monitoring their pain level. So we want to use this as a barometer of how many symptoms the patient is having throughout their plan of care. Now we're going to be able to take those and then say, okay, well, is this too much pain? Is this too little pain? Are your symptoms improving? Where are you on the scale? And what are you reporting to me? Because obviously we can't feel anything the patients are feeling. However, we can take objective measures, and those are going to come in the form of functional outcome measures. So functional outcome measures, you can learn a little bit more about these in our return to run guidelines for Achilles tendinopathy. However, I'll go through them briefly here, and what they're going to help us understand is how much load capacity the tendon has. So what we can do is a plantar flexion isometric strength with the di dynamometer. So we can use that. We can also do a single leg heel raise endurance test as a functional outcome measure. And we can also use our hop test cluster. Again, if you want to learn more about those, check out the return to run guidelines for Achilles tendinopathy. We go through each of them and we also talk about how to specifically do them. There's a link in the PDF right here that you can download. Additionally, you want to use the limb symmetry index as well the LSI, and that is going to be able to assess things like a readiness to return to running. So again, the LSI is explained when we talk about our return to run programs, and specifically in the Achilles tendinopathy document, you can see that as well. However, the key part here is that we want the LSI to be over 90 when we test these functional outcome measures. So again, remember, over 90 has the best outcomes when we are going to give someone a return to run plan. The other guideline we want to follow here is that we want to prescribe at least 12 weeks of consistent strengthening, and that's really going to achieve maximal results. Now, some studies went longer, but really, they didn't see any 
max results happen below 12 weeks. So remember that these may take 12 weeks to really get to, and I would encourage you to at least make a 12 week progression or a 12 week plan to make sure the patient is getting the most out of these eccentric strengthening exercises. Now you've heard me talk about guidelines a little bit, and you've also heard me talk about you know, what are the different uh, rules, kind of guides we should follow when we're making an Achilles tenopathy plan? Well, what are some of the evidence-based treatment programs or strengthening programs we can provide? Now, I'm including two here, and I have specifically given you some areas to look at in red and highlight in red. Now, these are from Sancho from 2023 and Nagel in 2020. And these are both really good articles to look over. There are some other articles out there that are really good as well. These two are some of the best evidence. And you can see here, they both incorporate eccentric strengthening. So I'll go over the left-hand side so you can see in a little more detail. And outside of the areas of boxed in red, you can see they obviously do some pain monitoring. They're looking at how much the person can do without pain. And also we're looking at circulation movements as well. A lot of them are gonna incorporate double-legged heel raises and single-leg heel raises. But you can see here what I highlighted was the eccentric heel raises standing on the floor. So from the floor going up and coming down just on that leg. Actually, this is going to be double leg, so we can do double leg first and progress to single leg. Excuse me. So again, the eccentric loading, we're going down to flat on the ground. We're not going below flat on the ground for this first phase. Now, in the second phase, you can see we're progressing to going up and then the eccentric load, so that eccentric strengthening going down all the way, and we're actually going off a step here. So we're using the step to go a little bit below. We're going into more dorsiflexion. I'll talk about a little bit more why end range dorsiflexion can be problematic, and so we want to be careful with those symptoms, especially if the person is getting symptoms in excessive end range dorsiflexion. Now, at the end of this treatment program on the left-hand side, you can see they've added some things like eccentric heel raises with uh, using weight, and that can be single leg and double leg, and we can see single leg heel raises at the edge of the step as well with weight. So that is some of their progressions, and then they do progress to things like jumping and plyometrics a little bit more, but I wanted to take this table on the right-hand side to show those in a little more detail. So the big takeaway here is eccentric loading. That's what's going to have the most research to be able to help patients get better. Now, I want to progress that into some plyometrics on the right-hand side too. So in this treatment program on the right-hand side, you can see there's a couple things to note. Now, they're talking about double leg heel raises slow and then a little bit quicker. They're using a metronome in beats per minute, and they're also prescribing both concentric and eccentric loading here. Now, they take you from double leg heel raises slow to double leg heel raises at a normal speed, heel raises slow, heel raises at a normal speed, and excuse me, that was going to be single leg in those. And then we can see that we progress to single leg heel raises with a weight and we load up that weight. So that's a good progression. And we're going from slow to a little faster and faster. Now, they also progress into double leg jumps, forward double leg or forward single leg jumps and then we get into jumps with minimal contact time so that's helping to not let the tendon or the muscle get any rest so that's giving you more hops and they're doing faster hops and as you can see then at the end we're doing single leg hops to fatigue and then we're self-selecting frequency obviously the faster you go the more load the more stress the more strain you're putting on and then skipping was part of their uh, program as well at 170 beats per minute, which is quite fast. Now, this also progressed into a plan of running and walking and then a return to run program as well. Again, go ahead and check out the return to run program that we've highlighted in the Achilles tendinopathy um, return to run guidelines. That can be a really good one to use. However, we can see here that this is a mix of being able to monitor symptoms to be able to give you some load, some eccentric load, some strengthening, and then we ramp up these centric load, we give you more and more weight, we give you more and more dorsiflexion range of motion, 
And then we're going to start to phase in some of those plyometrics as well. Again, we are slowly getting these added more and more complexity. And again, when we say load here, they didn't specify, but I do want to highlight here load and weight is going to be dependent on the patient and what they're doing. It's also going to be dependent on their weight and their strength. So you can take your functional outcome measures and then you can decide what's appropriate weight for them. Be judicious about what weight you're giving and obviously how much weight you're progressing and how fast. So let's get into the clinical pearls and what this means for us a little bit more. So for patients with Achilles tendinopathy, they can really benefit from eccentric strengthening. So we can confidently prescribe that to patients, but we do need to know what type of of injury they have, whether it's insertional and or midpoint or mid portion. And we want to make sure that we are giving good strengthening that we're not overly flaring up symptoms. Which leads me to my next point. Years ago, we used a method called the wait and see treatment approach. And that was basically limiting Achilles tendinopathy or Achilles tendon load and activity without giving strengthening exercises. However, the problem there was that if you were getting flare-ups of Achilles tendinopathy or if you're getting pain, unfortunately, then they had no choice but to just take you back on the activity level. And so it would have this kind of rebound effect of giving patients more to do and then calming back down. And unfortunately, it wasn't making a change. It wasn't actually making a strengthening change, a mechanical change, a structural change that would actually result in a different physiological makeup. They were just saying, bring down the inflammation levels. However, we do see that with patients where it is unavoidable that they're going to get pain no matter what, if they're doing some strengthening exercises, we kind of have no choice but to give them some of the wait and see method. So just bringing down how much activity and load. However, once those symptoms subside, we then want to give patients more to do. We want to give them some of the strength training, the plyometrics, and make a return to run plan. But we want to monitor that with the NPS, the LSI, and we want to use functional outcome measures. Now, there's a little bit of a debate in the research of how much pain is too much pain. Some people say that out there we need to have between two to five on the NPS, and that's an acceptable range of flare-ups. However, it's really dependent on the patient, and we do see a lot of variability, especially since it's a subjective measure. Now, there can be complications that arise in Achilles tendinopathy rehab, and we want to be cognizant of those. There are some knowledge gaps in the research as well. Now, new evidence does suggest that patients with insertional Achilles tendinopathy are more likely to experience impingement and are more likely to get pain during that end-range dorsiflexion strengthening. So for those patients, we should limit that end range dorsiflexion that they're doing. However, sometimes they just can't get back to that end range dorsiflexion. And in that case, we do see a surgical intervention potentially being considered. And that's something you can refer out for and have a surgical consult for. Now, eccentric strengthening is the best data, the best evidence that we have to get patients better. However, there is still some research out there that shows that tricep psoriasis strengthening does not correlate to improvements in Achilles tendinopathy. So clinicians should know that not all patients will benefit from eccentric strengthening under heavy resistance. And patients should know, or PTs should know that not all patients will improve. Some patients get better to a point, but don't get 100% better. Again, that's where we can look into other therapeutics and refer out to others in the medical community. But even with resolution of AT symptoms or Achilles tendinopathy symptoms, we don't necessarily see a complete recovery or function of the tendon itself. So some patients do, but most of the time we don't actually see that tendon is completely resolved, completely recovered from a physiological standpoint. So we want to advise patients to be able to progress back to running in activity, but we want to do that slow. We want to give them a slow progression, adding more frequency, intensity, duration of things like running. Now, the ways to avoid Achilles tendinopathy are really one of the best things that we can do for patients and the general public. So being able to educate patients, runners, athletes, that these are extremely common and also that they can be resolved or prevented 
really, really well. And that is if they are having minor symptoms, they want to manage that with load control and preventative strategies to avoid further injury. Now, I hope you learned a little something about Achilles tendinopathy and the exercise progressions. If you have any questions, make sure just to reply or leave a comment, and we'll be excited to talk to you soon. In the meantime, take care.